Hi everyone, I'm attorney Aiden Durham with 180 Lawco in Denver, Colorado. And welcome back to all up in my messy, disgusting, moving business. Just kidding, it's all up in your business. In this episode of All Up In Your Business, I'm going to break down some of the basics of non-compete agreements, tell you guys what they are, why they're important, and kind of generally how they work in the law. But before we get into it, please be sure to like, subscribe, and share, and don't forget to check the description for some links to additional information and resources. And finally, as with last time, uh, I'm moving, well, I recently moved, and I'm still in the process of unpacking and getting stuff organized, so uh, ignore the terrible mess behind me and bear with me while uh, things get adjusted around here, okay? Thanks. So what is a non-compete agreement? A non-compete, uh, also known as a non-competition, a covenant not to compete, a non-compete agreement is a restrictive covenant between an employer and an employee typically that puts some restrictions on what the employee can do once they're no longer employed by that employer. And generally speaking, it will restrict in one way or the other the employee from competing with the employer's business. Employers use non-compete agreements to protect um, proprietary information like their trade secrets um, or other uh, important confidential information. It's not solely for the purpose of just keeping someone from competing with you. It's more for the purpose of protecting some proprietary or important information of the employer. Now, non-competes aren't always between employees and employers. That's just kind of the context that I'm gonna talk about them in today, but non-competes can come up in other situations such as a business sale or purchase or some kind of a merger or um, even business partnerships. Uh, there can be non-competes in a lot of other contexts. But uh, generally, for the most part, they kind of all work the same. Uh, that's tough to say, actually, because non-competes are pretty um, they always work differently, but uh, for the most part, the things I'm gonna be talking about will apply in employer-employee non-compete relationships and other non-compete situations too. So like I said, uh, non-compete is typically used primarily for the benefit of the employer, and it's for the purpose of protecting the employer's um, trade secrets, their intellectual property, their proprietary information, things that this company, this employer has that if an employee went and took to another company or if that employee started their own company using that proprietary information, it could really damage the business of the employer. So that's why these non-competes are typically used is to really just protect the uh, important data and the important information of the employer that the employee may have come into contact with or been familiar with. And a lot of times when we're dealing with confidential or proprietary information of an employer, typically we'll also use something like a confidentiality agreement or a non-disclosure agreement, which in itself does help to protect that confidential information. An NDA or a confidentiality agreement would typically put restrictions on um, the employee or whoever's receiving the confidential information and keep it uh, so that that person can't use or disclose that information for any other purpose other than why it was given to them in the first place. So a lot of times these non-solicitations, or I'm sorry, these uh, NDAs or these confidentiality agreements will suffice to uh, protect a good deal of an employer's information. But in situations where an employee might have been very high level or have a lot of exposure to trade secrets or other proprietary info, then sometimes we want to take some extra steps to protect that information and um, the business of the employer by using these restricted covenants or restrictive covenants such as non-competes or non-solicitation agreements. I'm not gonna talk a ton about non-solicitation agreements in this video because um, that 
will take forever. But uh, just so you all know, a non-solicitation is another restrictive covenant similar to a non-compete in that it just uh, prohibits someone from soliciting um, customers or clients or employees or other people who have been involved with um, the employer. So basically the employee can't go in and like poach or uh, take all the business. But so those are kind of similar to non-competes in that sense. So right off the bat, it's important to say that not all non-competes are created equal and not all of them are enforceable. And in fact, it is very, very dependent on your state and your jurisdiction when it comes to the enforceability of a non-compete and what needs to be in there um, in order for it to be enforceable in the first place. Courts, generally speaking, um, aren't big fans of non-competes because for the most part, it, uh, they recognize that it can prevent an individual's uh, ability to make a living and to you know make an income and support their lives and all of that. So it's not easily going to be enforced in a lot of situations, but there are certainly times when non-competes are upheld, are completely valid and enforceable. There are, however, some states where non-competes are invalid just by default. They're just, we don't do them unless uh, certain circumstances exist or uh, except for a few certain situations. So there are some states where just kind of across the board, non-competes are invalid except for certain circumstances. So again, this is gonna vary state by state and jurisdiction by jurisdiction. But generally speaking, non-competes are used for a few reasons. Number one, again, to protect um, valuable proprietary info or trade secrets. Also to help um, uphold the value of the goodwill of the employer. And then typically for reasons of like uh, investing in employee training or something. If uh, you hire an employee and they have no idea what they're doing and you have to put a lot of time and money and effort into teaching that person what to do, training them on their entire job, then usually you know you don't want that person to then hit the road, start their own business competing with you using all of the skills that you just taught them. So those are kind of the typical reasons that a non-compete is going to be used. There are always uh, you know, other situations where this comes up, but those are kind of generally situations of what we want to protect with a non-compete. So like I said, in some jurisdictions, non-competes are just, for the most part, invalid and not enforceable. In California, for example, um, their state statutes say that non-competes are unenforceable in employment situations. So an employer putting a non-compete against an employee for the most part is unenforceable, but they do allow it in situations of a business purchase or a merger. And that doesn't mean that employers in California are um, completely out of luck when it comes to protecting their confidential info. Uh, just because you may not be able to use a non-compete with employees, you can still protect information with those NDAs or confidentiality agreements too. Same goes for Colorado. Colorado is one of these states that generally just doesn't like non-competes. Um, and our statutes in Colorado say, uh, non-competes are invalid and unenforceable except in certain situations such as the purchase of a sale or the sale and purchase of a business or merger or acquisition or situations where it is a very high level um, executive position that the person may have been exposed to a lot of a very valuable or confidential information. So there are exceptions to these rules, um, but such as Colorado and California, um, I believe North Dakota, uh, Oklahoma, I think Texas probably, um, there are certainly a handful of states that just kind of across the board don't like non-competes and won't enforce them except in very specific circumstances. 
Speaking of Texas, if any of you are in Texas and want to know more about non-competes, I really encourage you to check out my friend Zach Wolf on YouTube and on his blog. Uh, he is the Texas non-compete lawyer. I'll link to him down in the bottom, but uh, he's one of my good, good buddies from social media and a great lawyer and knows a lot about non-competes, uh, especially in Texas. So I recommend you guys check him out too. So there's first the question of, is my non-compete enforceable to begin with, depending on your state, your jurisdiction's laws. Then there are gonna be issues of certain industries where non-competes may not be enforceable. Um, this applies a lot in the legal industry. Us lawyers, uh, we generally uh, can't really restrict each other. I, I can't use non-competes like in law firms for lawyers because that is preventing the general public from access to legal counsel by putting a non-compete on me, for example, if I worked for a law firm, um, now people who wanted to work with me wouldn't be able to, and that's against public policy. So in the legal profession, um, non-competes are pretty frowned upon. Same goes with the medical profession. Again, um, courts don't want to prevent people from seeking medical attention or being able to get medical attention from their preferred doctors. So putting non-competes on medical professionals, um, typically in a lot of states is, is not gonna work or is gonna be pretty hard to enforce. There are also some jurisdictions that have um, restrictions on non-competes with regard to low wage workers or um, minimum wage workers. So in some states, if uh, the worker is being paid, um, you know, the federal or state minimum wage, then those non-competes are gonna be largely unenforceable. But again, all of this is very dependent on state law and um, your jurisdiction. So if you've got questions about your particular state's um, non-compete laws or how they might be enforced, I really encourage you to talk to a lawyer in your state about that because I don't know the laws of every state and even if I did, I wouldn't wanna spend a video talking about all of them because that might be a little boring. But anyway, you guys get the point. So now that we know kind of a little bit about uh, what a non-compete is, what it does, how it may or may not be enforced, uh, let's talk about how we actually make one that will hopefully be upheld and valid and enforceable. So uh, a non-compete agreement is a contractual obligation. And so by virtue of that, it has to uh, contain things that create a contract. Uh, in a nutshell, a contract, uh, legally speaking, is a, a, an agreement between two parties. Um, and there has to be some form of consideration, which is like one party um, giving something up in exchange for what they might be receiving. Um, again, I don't want to go super into this because it's pretty detailed. But in order for it to be a valid enforceable contract, um, there has to be a, a bargained for exchange and some form of uh, consideration, which typically in the employer employee context would be like um, getting a job or giving up the ability to um, fire an employee if uh, there's some sort of um, employment term or something in the contract. In a lot of jurisdictions, um, employment is at will, which means that a, an employee can quit or can be fired at any time for any reason um, or with no reason. And so in those situations, um, sometimes the promise of continued employment um, will be sufficient consideration to uphold a non-compete. Uh, sometimes it won't. Again, it all really depends on the jurisdiction, um, but kind of the idea to think about is that in, in exchange for agreeing not to compete, I am receiving the benefit of employment. And so all states um, where non-competes are enforceable, um, all states have placed some restrictions on what exactly can be restricted in the non-compete. And generally, uh, non-competes have to be reasonable in scope as far as duration and geographic reach of the non-compete. And again, this is because there's this balance between 
wanting to protect the employer's um, confidential information, but also wanting to protect the employee's ability to work and to make a living. So when we are trying to enforce these, one of the big first questions is going to be, is the duration and scope of the non-compete reasonable? And what is reasonable, again, depends on your jurisdiction. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's always going to be a little different. What's reasonable here? What's reasonable there? But so for example, a commonly phrased non-compete might say that um, the employee won't uh, be involved with or own or have an interest in a competing business for the duration of one year within the uh, state of wherever the employer is operating, or maybe a term of uh, two years within the within 50 mile radius of any of the employer's uh, office locations, something like that. Uh, again, they're really customizable. It can it can be drafted however the uh, situation fits, but the purpose, the idea is keeping it reasonable. And a lot of times if the um, duration is really high, so if we're trying to restrict someone for five years, then the geographic scope needs to be relatively low and vice versa. If we wanna put a big geographic scope, like you can't compete anywhere in the United States, then we need to keep the duration pretty low, like for a month. Uh, just for example. Most courts, uh, generally speaking, um, will enforce uh, non-competes with scopes up to two years. That's kind of the time frame that I hover around when I'm working on non-competes for my clients. Um, we know that two years in a lot of situations is considered reasonable, but again, it also um, has a lot to do with the, the scope of the um, the geographic scope of the restrictions, and it really depends on the the circumstances in particular of the employee. If they were a very high level employee that had their hands in a lot of things and had a lot of exposure to proprietary information, then um, that that standard of reasonableness is gonna be a bit higher. But if it's like an administrative level where uh, the employee didn't have a whole lot of exposure to confidential information, or if um, their, their role was smaller, or if their time with the employer was uh, very short, then the same things that would fit for that high level employee wouldn't necessarily fly for that lower level employee. So it's, it's a delicate balance of a million different factors, uh, but primarily based on the reasonableness of the scope and duration of the non-compete. And then the reasonableness of the um, geographic scope is also going to be really dependent on the employer's business um, and where the employer does business, where their office or offices are located. There's going to have to be some, uh, you know, genuine real connection between this geographic scope and what the employer actually does. If you're, you know, a brick and mortar um, store or uh, office in one city and your entire client base is really in that city, then you're going to have a hard time putting any non-compete restrictions um, that keep employees from competing uh, outside of your state, if even really outside of that city. So it has to be reasonable um, in light of the employer's circumstances too. Now, of course, in our uh, modern world, it's pretty common for um, companies to be internet based and not have a physical location or work with people all over the country or all over the world. And so sometimes having a geographic scope doesn't really make sense because it, it's all over. And so uh, again, state, uh, every jurisdiction is different, but there are situations where a non-compete can still be um, valid and enforceable if it doesn't have a geographic scope. So if um, we're a virtual worldwide company, we can potentially put a restriction for employees not to compete with us anywhere in the world. But again, it has to be kind of balanced with the um, scope or the duration of the restriction. And typically we want to be a bit more specific with regard to what competing is. So again, if we're going to be 
kind of on the higher end of reasonableness with um, scope or duration, then we might want to be really specific as to what competing means and be very um, limited with this is the specific type of, of business or business operation or company that would be considered competing. So it still allows the employee to um, do similar types of work or continue in their same field of employment, but except for maybe particular um, specific fields or industries. So as you guys may have picked up, it's kind of tough to talk about non-compete agreements because they are different in every state, every situation, um, just like everything with the law. But really, uh, non-competes and restrictive covenants like non-solicitations very much uh, vary state by state. And so if you need help or if you have questions or if you're looking for information about non-competes or non-solicitations, it's super important that you consult with an attorney in your state. But overall, for the most part, non-compete agreements are a great way to protect uh, your business's intellectual property, proprietary information, and to um, kind of protect the goodwill and the um, potential outcome for your business. But so if you're in a state or in a situation where non-compete isn't going to apply or probably won't be enforceable, then again, using an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement or a confidentiality agreement is going to be a very good way of still protecting um, that confidential information without risking a, an unenforceable non-compete. And uh, here's a kind of a common conversation that I have with a lot of my clients. In Colorado, again, non-competes are for the most part frowned upon and unenforceable unless certain circumstances exist. Um, and I'll tell my clients that, but often they will still want to do it. And, uh, and so, and I have this conversation a lot in consultations and stuff too. The, the idea is that Sure, we can write this non-compete. If you wanna keep some employee from competing if they quit or if they're fired, we can write it, we can put it in the contract. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure it's enforceable. But uh, if the employee tries to challenge it or if the employee competes and we try to enforce it, there's a good chance it's not gonna be upheld. Um, and I, I have to tell my clients that a lot because uh, I'm their advisor. I'm telling them what they can and can't do, but they're still in the driver's seat. And if they want a non-compete in their agreement um, or in their contract, I can tell them about why it probably won't work, but we can still put it in there and hope that if the need arises, that it would actually be enforceable. Um, and that's a situation that I see a lot because we don't know if a non-compete is going to be enforceable until we try to enforce it. So um, again, when it comes to non-competes, uh, there's a lot of moving pieces and a lot of different factors. That's all for this episode, folks. Drop a comment below. Let me know what you think. Um, again, please don't ask me questions about um, your state's uh, issues or don't ask me questions about your non-competes because they're all going to be different. I don't know all the state's laws. I don't know all the laws. So talk to an attorney in your state if you have questions about enforcing or drafting or how to handle a non-compete agreement. Thank you all so much for watching. I'm Aiden Durham, and I'll see you next time.